So today I'm joined by a really special guest, one of the great characters of rugby league and somebody who wears his heart on his sleeve. Um, you just never are left into any doubt at all what Ricky Stewart's thinking when he's on the sideline or sitting up in the grandstand. And unfortunately, we have too few characters like that. But just quickly on his career, he uh, is uh, the 103rd inductee into the NRL Hall of Fame. He won premierships, went on Kangaroos Tours, World Cup, Dally M Player of the Year 93, Dally M Halfback of the Year 1990 and 1993, Clive Churchill Medal winner 1990, and Rothman's Medal winner as well. And to that, you can also add that uh, he's had a stellar coaching career. He won at his first attempt with the Roosters, the grand final, and they played in two more grand finals. So, Ricky, welcome, and um, thank you for joining me. We're not at a time when, mate, you're at the beginning of what is going to be a tough season, not just for the Raiders, but for everybody in the NRL, but also you've got a game tomorrow against the Cowboys, and for you to give up your time is special. Thank you. No worries. Thanks, David. I appreciate the, um, uh, the introduction. It was a um, some great times had, some great memories, fond memories, and uh, a lot of success too. But um, very fortunate to play in a, a great era of players for the Canberra Raiders, great coaches, and Tim Sheens and Mal Meninga, where I finished my career at the Raiders uh, with as a, our coach. And um, very, fo very fortunate to have um, spent so much time with so many great players and players that uh, are still on the lips and the um, the minds of so many rugby league supporters of today. Yeah, and you talk there about the Laurie Dailies of this world and um, and Brent Todd even from from over here in New Zealand. And uh, I'm not a Kiwi, obviously, but, but you know, a lot of people here that get this will know who he is. And yeah, it was a fantastic side. And, and I think anybody who didn't have a team would have been supporting the Raiders back in the late eighties and early nineties. Yeah. Those early days, we, the, the club recruited very wisely from Brisbane, uh, from, uh, from New Zealand. And it sort of started a, um, it, it really kicked off some success here in, uh, in Canberra for the club, for the, for the Raiders. And, you know, started by Mal Meninga in 86 when he joined the club followed on by a number of uh, uh, players that would then become on, uh, that would go on to become internationals in Gary Belcher, the Walters brothers, um, a number of the New Zealand boys who were um, um, followed by, uh, followed Brent Todd, Brent Todd, Ruben Wiki, uh, Quinton Pongia, Sean Oppie, Johnny Lomax, I've, I've missed a number of them, but um, a number of players who came to the club, started their NRL career and moved on to become internationals and origin players and um, it was an era that we had a lot of success on the back of great talent and uh, and what teams are all about in regards to working for each other and becoming good mates. One of the things I would like to know before we get right into things is where did you get the nickname from, Sticky? It's, it's stupid. Um, <laughs> I had a flatmate called Perry Smith who I uh, actually played rugby yep. union with. Yeah, yeah, and, I know. Uh, Perry... Uh, and Steve Libri, we, we were living together in uh, the early early nineties, and he uh, he was used to call me um, uh, Sticky Ruit. So you just changed the, uh, the the S T around and the R around, and it was Sticky Ruit. But uh, I think God, oh, Sticky stuck. So <laughs> it, uh, stupid, but it stuck. And it's a um, I get people walking through the street saying "G'day, Sticky." I don't even know them. So <laughs> no, no, but I mean that's that's a testament, I think, to your uh, profile and the fact that I mean, yeah, Perry Smith, I didn't know so much. I knew Libo a little bit better because uh, he was obviously a Warringah player, and I used to That's train right. train down there when I was refereeing and uh, came yep. across Libo and a good guy. He played rugby league and uh, didn't he? And um, then he, he had did. To he played here. Yeah, they both yeah. played here. And Steve broke his neck in 1988. Yeah, um, 89 might have been. Sorry, and. Um, uh, we were living together then. That was a, quite a um, ordeal because he was on the verge of making uh, first grade and broke his neck at Penrith. And he was very fortunate actually not to have uh, further damage that um, yeah. he actually did get off the field. He was going to stay on with a, a spasm that, or what he, what he thought, a spasm in the neck. And yeah, um, but he was in all sorts of trouble the next day. And 
I went to get scanned and the doctor raced out, wrapped a towel around his neck and uh, said, don't move. Rushed him off to hospital and he had broken his neck. Jeepers. Very lucky. Very lucky guy. Good guy. Um, Good I, yeah. I mean, I, I mentioned earlier on about the lack of real characters in the game these days. I mean, there's guys like yourself and Bellamy. Nobody watches you guys sitting on the sideline or up in the comment, up in the coach's box. Have any doubt about what you're thinking? <laughs> and Hi. and and I just be and that's born of passion, isn't it? I mean, it's just sheer passion for the game. I yeah, you know, I'm, I'm passionate about the game, David. But um, it's just it, it's the it's the desire to win. You know, yeah. it's um, I. I, I, I wished I didn't have that emotion, and I'm sure Craig does too. I'm very close with Craig. We had a couple of beers last week before we played each other at Wagga, and I uh, went in and had a beer with him in his change rooms after the game and congratulated him. But uh, we're very similar in a number of ways, and it's just the desire to win. Um, but, um, you know, there's times I feel like I'm an idiot on the sideline, but it's not as though I go out there and I've got it all pre script pre-scripted it's it's not something that it's scripted out and i think well i'm going to kick this chair at this time um look it's it's who i am you've got to have a release of some sort ricky because i've said to you on a couple of occasions i don't know how you do this i don't know how you and guys like bellamy and co um who week after week put 100 100 hours a week in or more into this um, and you know, then you cop flack when the team loses and all that sort of thing, and the team doesn't play like you trained. I, 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 I'm in awe of actual people who coach. I could, I've got the wrong personality to coach. That's why I went refereeing. But I, um, yeah, I, I do take my hat off to all of you. It's it, look, it is it is difficult. You you do everything you can possibly do during the week in preparation for the outcome. And then for 80 minutes, you're vulnerable because you've got no handle on the outcome. And when you're vulnerable like that, you feel at times you're, you're, you're hoping that uh, you've, you've prepared the boys well enough. Um, you know, there's not, there hasn't been too many games where I've uh, had the boys leave the change room and you think, well, why don't, I can't see how you, we can't win today. You know, yeah. that's the confidence you've got to have in your team, the confidence you've got to have in your preparation and, the, and your coaching. And things don't always go to plan, but uh, you know we are the four, the four face of it all, and we are the one to cop the blame. You you sign up for that, you understand it, but uh, you never. As long as they, you always like it, but that's you know that's your job. That's um, unfortunate. I got a team here that they were all very competitive people too, and um, competitive to the nature where they want to they want to win at all costs, and um, that's important because that comes into their DNA in, in preparation and how they get to the uh, sideline. And, you know, that's that's what we try and breed here. You know, you, you like to think that uh, your team's a, a, a shadow of yourself in regards to replicating what your characteristics are. And uh, I know the players care and, and they want to win. Well, absolutely. I mean, there's not a coach that I know who would actually... Be, be in it if they in, they weren't in it to win it. I mean, it's perhaps a little bit more obvious um, in, in yourself. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, you know, this, this, this winning is terribly important in a professional sport. And, um, and I just wonder, you know, it seems to me that perhaps the media, I've always been very critical of sports media because I don't think that they show duty of care to coaches. They do to players. But when coaches, when they go after a coach or even an administrator to a lesser extent, it's all guns blazing. And, and I think that that is very unfair. But I, I don't know. You tell me. I don't read all the stuff in the Sydney papers, but are they becoming a little bit more grown up and, and, and understand the pressures of coaches or is it still the same? Oh, David, I don't think anybody understands the pressures of coaches unless you've been there or you live with a coach. Yep. You, know, you can go and ask a player's, oh, sorry, a coach's partner, you go and ask a coach's wife, um, family, what the pressures of coaching are, and you probably get a greater insight. There's no journalists that understand it. There's no journalists that really want to understand it. Um, the, journalists is about, the journalists is about a headline. 
Um, I've seen journalists hunt down coaches and, and hunt down coaches to the extent where they chase the board. And when they chase the board, you've got weak board members. Weak board members make weak decisions. And then all of a sudden, they make it easier for themselves in regards to just going out and sack the coach. Yeah. Um, but then the journalist has done his job. He's got the headline for the last five, four, five, six weeks. Um, then he's on to his next bloke. Yep. And that that is the um, the part of journalism I don't uh, respect. Um you, you hear a lot of the journals. I'm sorry, you hear a lot of the comment from journals. I don't read a lot, to be honest. No. Um, I can read a headline in first paragraph and I know who the journalist is without even seeing the name. Mm. Um, but there are good journalists too. I, I must admit, there are journalists that understand and do take care in regards to what they write. Um, but there is so much of a platform now for um, comment whether it's social media, whether it's TV, whether it's radio, whether it's newspaper, magazines now, there is so much, plat so many platforms for comment from uh, uh, people sitting on the fringe that uh, the cheap journalism will chase any headline to get a, a click on the computer, get the, get, the, get the numbers up. So that's where it makes it difficult for the journalism, uh, journalists, I should say. But and in saying that, there are some, there's some, and I find a couple of the younger journalists coming through that have been mentored by the senior journalists who have been in the game for a long time th through having the ability and respect from players and coaches. Yep. Um, there are a few senior journalists at the moment that do understand the game and, and do respectfully um, research their comment. But I mean, you know, and, and the journalists that you spoke of before who don't have that, right, who just go after people you know it, it, to me um it's bordering on cowardice you know and the reason i say that is that <laughs> a great man once told me um kerry packer um you know when i got to the nrl and he said son and that's what he used to call everybody <laughs> where he said son don't pick a fight with an organization where they buy printing ink by the tanker load <laughs> mm. and yeah. and you can't you can't you can't go back at these people and they no. hide behind that you know they they say outrageous things they take no care there's no duty of care about the personal person that they're attacking but i was hoping you know i mean I, and hopefully with these new journals coming through um you know we might see a difference now there is one area that uh, <laughs> I never refereed rugby league, right? But I, I thought there were some good referees. You know, there was there was Hollywood Hartley, <laughs> who was, you know, I think he had himself up there as big as the game. That was the days when the referee used to come out first, you know, race out to oh, the yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. But, yeah. uh, Hollywood would be out there. Um, and then you've, you've had some other, what I regard as good referees, you know, guys that did grand finals and in, in the first 30 minutes never gave a penalty uh, because it was a grand final. Um, but you've had your ups and downs with the referees. Yep, I certainly have. And um, I think I've got better over the last uh, couple of months. No, I'm only joking. <laughs> uh, <laughs> over the, uh, I made a big mistake in... Um, I made a big mistake in uh, 2010 when uh, I got beaten in the World Cup final. I think it was 10. I think it was 2010. I got beaten in the World Cup final by um, New Zealand. I, I made an uh, awful mistake there in regards to a um, uh, confrontation I had with the referee. And uh, to this day now, we're, you know, we're obviously communicate. I, and it was Ashley Klein, I, you know, and I see yeah. Ashley quite a lot. And, um, when we actually got back to that next season, 2011, I was at Cronulla. He, he was actually refereeing a trial match and uh, I knocked on the change room door and I don't know who got the biggest biggest surprise. Um, he's, he's touched judges when they opened the door or Ashley, but I went in and just shook his hand and I said, mate, uh, more fool of me. It was very much an yeah. apology. And uh, from there on in, we, we, we've got on and um, or hope to hope to have uh, resolved it. But uh, that was uh, that was a mistake. But uh, I've worked back from that. I, not, not many people would know or see the fact that I, I, I've done a lot of 
had a lot of communication with referees bosses over the years in how do we make it easier for the referees i i care for the referees i feel for their jobs um and bill arrogan and i had some great great battles but um at the end of the day we both respect each other and i still remember probably five years ago i put my hand out to shake hands with bill at a uh, function uh, i was at, at the hall of fame function actually and um he was you know we, we had a uh uh disagreement probably my fault again and i i'm a man and put my hand out and i said bill i i get it if you don't like me but i just want to make sure you're you understand that i'm open to communication and and we do um i think bill's the best referee that i've had yeah. as a player and or as a uh, coach and uh, uh we miss we miss the we miss the bill harrigan of refereeing because Bill would make a decision on his own uh, accord. Bill would be his own man. Yeah, yeah. Um, he would not last today with so many voices in his ear. And I think it's a um, it's affecting, it's a disadvantage to have so many voices in the referee's ear. Oh, absolutely, mate. Now, I know you you played rugby. You went to St Edmunds, didn't you? You lived in Queensland, right. went to St Edmunds yeah. Rugby School. Um, and then you were picked uh, on the Wallabies tour to go to Argentina. That's right. So you're dual, yeah. So you're a dual international, and um, yeah, I don't know if they class it as dual because I was on the bench for a test, but I never got onto the actual field. I played yeah. uh, three or four provincial games on that tour. It was a great, oh. great learning curve. Uh, yeah, Alan James was a coach and <laughs> been a been a great mentor of mine for many many years. Alan has he. And, yeah. Been a man to be on side with and offside. Yes, I, I know, mate. And I could never understand how I got offside with him because, you know, <laughs> he wouldn't have anything to do with me when I was at the NRL and I tried. Oh, but, don't worry. I've been there too, mate. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, perhaps it was I refereed. Well, when he was coaching Manly Rugby, you know, I refereed first grade down there a couple of times. Perhaps I didn't... Um, do a good enough job in his eyes. Uh, I can't yeah. remember, but um, yeah, no. You, see, where are these characters today, mate? You know, that's what. That's what. I mean, if I it's, was, it, it gets knocked out of you. No. Yeah, yeah. Because it's seen. It's probably seen as not politically correct. Um, you know, I've been banned from the sideline. I go to the box. I can't stand it in the box. I go back to the sideline and. Um, I've got to change my character. I've got to change my ways. Um, I know, you know Craig in the privacy of his own box swears or whatnot. I know he's been dragged over the coals for it. Um, but why, mate? Everybody swears these days. Even the kids swear. I mean, it's and, and we we the fan. I'm a fan of rugby league, right? I mean, I'll be watching your game tomorrow night, and I watch pretty much all the games. So I don't watch rugby anymore because I got into trouble one time. I, I ref Phil Gould had had a crack at, at um, Super Rugby when it first started, and he called it basketball on grass, right? <laughs> yeah. So I said, well, that's better than bloody five tackle kick. Yeah. Right? And um, But now I never thought I would say this, mate, but rugby's become bash and kick. That's it. You know, where's all this? Yeah, where's our running rugby? You would have played running rugby when you were yeah. playing for Australia. Where's my, my two boys? My two boys are played league. They play union. I've watched a lot of union over the last uh, nine years uh, since I've come back to Canberra coaching. And my boys went through St Evans, and then they both played for the Whites. My uh, youngest boy has just got back from um, uh, having a couple of um, tours with the Wallabies Sevens. Outfit yeah. and uh, he couldn't, uh, he didn't get a contract with them. Uh, so we come back. Actually, he's come back. He's going to have a little bit of a crack at uh, uh, league with our under 21s and then decide whether he's going to hang around or go back to union. But um, both my boys have played a lot of union over the last nine years and I've watched a lot and they've gone from schoolboys first 15 into cults into first grade. And it's great. It's great viewing. But as every year goes up from schoolboys into, into cults into first grade, uh, the game just gets stifled by the nitpicking. And I don't, I don't blame the refereeing. I blame the interpretation. Yeah. It's, it's, it's above the refereeing. They're, they're only doing their job. And it's exactly what I've been asking our seniors involved with our refereeing and our administration is we have to make the game 
simplify the game for the referee. Take away, take away so much of the grey area, because nowadays there is there is too much stop start and rego. I agree with the bunker, but let's get to the bunker and get out of the bunker. But if you can't see it in one or two goes, get out of there. Yeah. Um, and let the TV, let the let Channel Nine or Fox um, replay it, replay it, replay it. And if it's a wrong decision. It's a wrong decision. Oh, we had a game last week where Munster made a break. Um, it was a great break. Cameron Munster, a great football player. Pass inside, it was a forward pass to Pappenhausen. The referee, Sutton, goes to, put the refer goes to put the whistle to his mouth to blow forward pass, which was a correct decision. And then drops the whistle and keeps going. Mm. So one, I don't understand the movement of the going to the mouth with the whistle because that's a, that's a, that's a mental reaction in regards to he saw a forward pass, I'm going to blow it. Yep. So did he get something in the ear? I'm not bothered to ring his bosses. I'm not bothered to find out because the result's over. But yeah, yeah, I, I feel as though we make it too hard for our referees, which is what's happening in rugby union. And I mean, it's number one game in it's number two game in Europe outside soccer, rugby, and they absolutely love it. And 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 I've played rugby in in Europe, and I get the passion for it. We here with rugby league being our probably our number one sport or number one with uh, AFL. AFL. Yep. Yeah. It's a fast flowing game, both AFL and rugby league. And when we have rugby, and I, I'm not, I, I, I love rugby. Union. So I'm not, I'm not a, a um, rugby league coach criticizing union because I, I dearly love it. But when you've got AFL and uh, rugby league is a fast flowing game, a lot of action, a lot of intensity and a lot of ball movement. And then there's a lot of stifled attack and a lot of set piece and a lot of ruck and maul with yeah. rugby. I understand why people are turning off it. I really do. And I often say, if we don't get our rugby league interpretation right, it's going to be, we're going to lose people. Yeah, I mean, and and, and that's where that's where I come from. And I've put forward a, an alternative to world rugby to consider, um, which is, um, uh, it's 11 aside, played in four quarters of 11 minutes. And it's got, it, it's, a, it's an authentic game of rugby, but it is going to be, a lot faster um, and more open than, you know. You take the two breakaways and two wingers off. No, it just took, the, yeah, two breakaways and, um, yeah, essentially, yeah, mm. that's what's happened. So there's six in the forwards, five in the backs. Mm. I might send you the, um, I might send you the stuff actually and you can have a look at it. I'd be very interested in. I'd love to. Think. Yeah. yeah. I'd love to, yeah. Um, now, so the, the other thing that, um, that, you know that I'm I'm very interested in is how you think the administration of the NRL is going because you know from a distance, Vlandis looks like he's doing a really good job. You know he's proactive. He doesn't seem to be as thin-skinned as most of the administrators in world sport. You know, and I think that's a real problem for them um, because they can't take any sort of criticism, uh, whether it's good criticism or bad. I mean. You know, so I just wondered what your thoughts were on the administration of it. Well, if you if you can't cop criticism, you can't be involved in the administration of the NRL. You know that. Yeah. Um, as Kerry Packer told you, they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna get you um, if they're not happy with the decision you make. And then you're gonna have another another line of journalists over there from the other side of the media industry who uh, will support you if the other if the other mob are knocking you. So it's a game. It's a yeah. uh, it's theatre, yeah. But in regards to our administration, um, I'm a great fan of uh, Peter Valandis because he's very proactive, and I'm I'm a person who's always been a um, uh, bit radical in regards to making uh, decisions to get a result. I see Peter as very radical in regards to he, he's educated and level headed, but he he does make a radical decision at times, but. So far, he's won. And yeah. you can see that with his racing. He's he's taken on the big boys and he's winning. So yeah. he goes to taking on the Melbourne uh, racing fraternity and he's winning. Yeah. Like you take you take racing back 10 years ago, we were nowhere as a profile in regards to the Melbourne uh, no. racing scene. Um, he's so taken you've got, on AFL. Yeah. And, 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 you've, and, I, and you've, sorry, go ahead. So I, no, I'm, I'm actually quite proud of that leadership. I, yeah, I want could. that type of leader. And for me, if he comes out and makes a decision and he, he stuffs up, it's wrong, I'll support it. 
because yeah. he's having a go. And he's not using his position as a leader of the NRL to leverage his way into another position. No. He's he's a leader of the game and wants to get results. I'm I've got and I'm unashamed. I'm not not I've been biased towards uh Peter Valandis. I'm unashamed of it because I can see that he's doing a he's doing his very best. He's not leveraging off it in regards to finding another job, another position, or for himself. He's doing it because he loves the game. And mate, I have to say that that um that you know anybody who knows you. Um, would understand that you're just speaking from the heart and that's what that's all we ever want to hear from guys you know like yourself and you you are one of those people that just tells it as it is um you get a bit i get a bit sick of it uh they dave because you know people want to hear it from you they want to hear it from the heart but then you gotta you hear it for the next three days where people think oh look, this is a great opportunity for me to get a story a headline or whatnot oh, and, yeah, and, true. and they want to have a crack at you so i thought well, what what the hell mm. i um I don't, need then, the, I don't need the drama, so I just don't say anything. But people people in our game are passionate about the game, and it doesn't mean that I'm always right. I'm not not always right. When people oh. ask me for an opinion, you give an opinion, you, you just don't want to hear about it for the next week no. and, and, and get criticised and, and, and dragged and bagged publicly. So I think, fuck it, just don't say anything and uh, just get on with my job. I got that once, mate, when I was at the NRL. I was just, it was a Parramatta, and I was just, be, you know, we're talking to a few of the journos, and I said I was going to be going off to the Tour de France with my son. We'd never done that, right? He's in the cycling business, and he cycles still. Well, <laughs> yeah, they wanted to know why, why I thought I could take any time off during the middle of a you know rugby league season when I've got ample good people running it on a day-to-day -day yeah. basis. But in yeah. the end, in the end I didn't go because it became it, it became all about me. I mean, you know, and Sad. and I and I look yeah. back and I say, and I wish I'd never told them I'd just sort of said I, yeah. you know, I'd be gone. And you know, but they they do pick up on some of the weirdest things which they think they're gonna turn into a big story. Um, well, you're not allowed to be a dad. You're not allowed no. to be a, a, a husband. You're not allowed. You, you've got to be what they want you to be, and that's what I won't let them do. No, I, I won't let them. I won't let them conform me to what they want. Um, mate, NRL coaches are like the shooting ducks at a uh, sideshow. Mm. You know, when it's your turn, they're going to be having a go at you. you know, they'll whack you, and they might miss you this time, but they'll get you next time. You're just on the. You're just on the. The, <laughs> yeah. the, 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 the cycle. And the hurdy gurdy, yeah. yeah. But. You know, and I've had that for 20 years, so I've got through it and don't really care about the guys who've got the actual, uh, the gun there having a crack at you. It's just a matter of being happy with what you're doing. And as I say, you know, you're not allowed to leave, a, you're not allowed to lead a normal life in a lot of people's eyes. No, no. Mate, I'm just as a, I'm interested in, I was doing a bit of research and I noticed today, <laughs> oh, well, I found something which said that there was this apparent feud between you and Robbo. What are you able to say? What that's all about, or is it true? Or is oh, it I think that just gained that. They just gained a lot of momentum. Um, yeah. I um, uh, what was it? Two thousand nineteen. We yeah. were all introduced out in front of the crowd at uh, in Sydney at uh, Martin Place, I think. Um, and I, I I just went out and stood there. I didn't shake Trent's hand, but. Um, I didn't see it as a big thing, but it was made up to be a big thing. And I don't think people were happy about it, but fuck, I mean, it was not big to me, mate. You know, no, was, no. he was my competitor. The opposition were our competitors and, yeah. and that's why I do battle. Um, I, I don't disrespect or dislike the person uh, personally. I think he does a great job at the Roosters um, and done a wonderful job over many years. Um, and I'll actually, uh, big chance I'll have a, uh, have a chat with him this week because we've got our uh 20 year reunion for the 2002 grand final team oh with, right uh, with the warriors we got it on this weekend so fortunately i play th thursday night and i can have two days with uh, all the all the boys that uh, won the grand final that year so i'm looking forward to it and we're having lunch with the current team and their coaching staff on saturday after their captain's run so i'm looking forward to that yeah, that'd be great. And but there again, it goes to show you know, just a small thing like that gets turned into World War Three, and yeah, and, and that's oh look, there's mate, there's always banter between coaches. Yeah, sure, and, of course and, there is. Yeah, but you know, I 
for me to see another coach in a pub, not to go up and have a beer with him or say hello to him, I mean, I don't think there's a coach in the game that I wouldn't. Um, no. Mate, Poo, David, people don't aim me outside TV no. and coaching. Uh, honestly, I'm, I'm a completely different person to what a lot of people know me as, and uh, that's why you know, people have their own opinions, but I know what I am. Well, um, and that's one of the one of the things I'm finding doing these podcasts is that I'm able to actually portray, you know, somebody as um, you know somebody a bit different. You know, I, I yeah. interviewed Richard Lowe the other day. You know, the bad boy of New Zealand rugby for eye gouging and all that. But when you talk to him, he's a completely different person. I played um, against Richard Lowe in uh, 1986, I think 86, 87, where it was an under 21 test. Daryl Halligan yeah. was a fullback, but played against him. Richard Lowe, Zinzan Brook, Michael yeah. Jones, the two Gordon brothers, Bashup, uh, uh, Preston. It was yeah. a number of the boys. Uh, we actually beat them. We played at the SEG yeah. for a, uh, a Wallabies game. And uh, it was, uh, I, I look back on that um, program and see so many Wallabies and um, it was a great pathway. So many Wallabies and um, All Blacks out of that 21s game. It was yeah. incredible. And actually, uh, I got billeted with a number of those boys over the many years of uh, touring New Zealand with Rugby Union. All oh, right. Okay. Um, one of the things that you have done um, is you've, uh, you've um, started um, a... Uh, what a, a foundation a foundation sorry yeah, yeah. i was just lost there yep. a foundation yep. uh, in, in honor of your daughter who yep. you know s suffers from uh, something which is you know my, i have a grandson that suffers from it as well um autism autism yeah, yeah. yeah. so yeah, yeah. It's, just... it, it's a lot more common than you think it's it's, it's a little bit like when you buy a uh, a yellow car or a green car then all of a sudden you see a lot more yellow cars and green cars around you know Emma, Emma was diagnosed at a little bit of a later age. She wasn't reaching milestones or whatnot, but she was um, uh, firstly diagnosed with a, a young girl with a global, global development delay, which means there's a part of a brain not working. But then that we kept chasing further um, opinion. And when she's about 11 or 12, she was diagnosed with autism and she's nonverbal. And um, we have then met a lot of other people with all different spectrums or also you know, right yeah. along the spectrum of uh, autism and you know it's been a it's been a wonderful journey with emma she's now living in a independent home but we've started a foundation on the back of emma and um little things that have really helped our family in respite living um just the awareness of autism itself we've just gone out a and, and created the foundation and we've built two homes uh, create a lot of awareness from a very small chair of foundation, create a lot of awareness, especially around the Canberra community in our region. Um, and I just actually um, just got a gift of a block of land and $4 million from the New South Wales government. And John Barillaro was heavily behind that. And uh, we're going to build now because Emma's living in an independent home. We can see how much benefit it is to our siblings and our family. Um, and more so, even bigger benefit on the uh, on the development and the maturity of Emma, she's like every other young um, teenager, adult, a uh, young adult who uh, move out of home. They want to get away from mum and dad, um, get a bit of freedom, and she's done that. She's living with another young lady now with carers twenty four hours a day, and it's just just been fam fabulous, David. So this four million and the block of land is going to go into a um, uh, a house. A five bedroom house, six bedroom one for the carer, but a five bedroom house for uh, young adults living with a disability. So it's something that we're, we're really proud of and something that's nice because you can give back a little bit. And it's through our learnings of uh, being a family living with them or with a uh, disability. So if, if anybody listening and watching this would like to donate, where, where would they go? Um, there is a website, RSF. Ricky Stewart uh, Foundation website, and um, it's only uh, only brand new. I think it's up and running. We just re uh, reset and reshaped a, a website, so um, that's uh, that's our main source of information. And it, it's it's for such a small foundation, it's really growing, and we've um, we're very proud of it. 
Yeah, and um, you know, and, and and so you should be. I mean, you know, uh, and, and of course, this is the side of uh, people like yourselves that the, the, the public don't necessarily see enough of. You know, it's it's like like players that go to visit sick kids in hospital, but the no, cameras aren't there. You know, yeah, there's a lot of that, mate. You, you've you seen know, that yourself. Yeah. You know, in rugby union, rugby league, all sports. Yeah, you know, there's so much good that is done through, um, you know, athletes who uh, um, want to want to give back a little bit. I mean, there's there's a lot more there's a lot more uh, good work done that's really seen, and you don't want it to be seen. You know, you, you don't you don't want a camera over your shoulder every time you go to a hospital or a uh, no. going out to help somebody. It's you know you got to feel good about giving. Yeah, yeah, without the the support of um, of the media. So just as a last point, Ricky, I just wanted to touch on a little bit your hopes for the season. You're four games in. You've got the um, um, had a bit of an up and down start, and uh, and I think you've got the Cowboys this weekend. That's right. Uh, yeah, Dave, we've we've had it's actually five games, and we're oh, five. two two from five. Um, I've got a good football squad here. We've had a little bit of a disrupted uh, off-season with um, losing Josh Hodgson and Jamal Fogarty for 14 weeks, Josh Hodgson for the season, Harley Smith-Shields, who was going to be playing in our centres for the season through ACLs, uh, Jamal Fogarty for 14 weeks through a knee injury as well. He had to get operated on. So it has been a, um, a disrupted start, but um, we, we just... We're not giving ourselves an opportunity in games. We've been, for our five matches, we've probably played a, a period of good 40 minutes, 30, 40 minutes per game. It's just nowhere near good enough for this quality or level of competition of, at, 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 a, at the NRL standard. So we, we really need to have a, a far greater contribution and performance for an 80-minute period. And we can do it. It's there. We've got, this, we've got the experience. We've got the squad. I've got some great young players coming through. And I'm really happy with my senior players that I've got. We, we most certainly can do it, but we just haven't been um, producing it. So um, it's certainly not pressing any panic buttons, but we need to get it on pretty soon because we need to find some rhythm. And that's probably the best way to, to describe it. We've got to find rhythm in our game, build some pressure on other football teams instead of putting pressure on ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, some of those younger players coming through, do you, do you feel that they've got good futures in the game? I do. i, I got some good young players here and... Um, I feel we've got a very good program here, we've a good pathway from our junior reps into our senior training programs. We've got good coaches here who put a lot of attention to detail towards personal development from, from high performance right through to on-field skills and development of, uh, as, a, as a football player. Um, it's a great club we've got here, David, and next time you're in Canberra, I'd love you to come across and be a guest and, and uh, show you through our facility and our programs. Uh, and share a beer with you because uh, I know you, you you love the game and uh, we're, we're very highly involved in the game here. It'd be great for you to come across as a guest and uh, spend some yeah. time here because we're very proud of our club. It's a um, uh, 40 years this year we're celebrating at uh, 40 years in the NRL and uh, it's been a short short period of time, but we've got a lot of had a lot of success over that uh, period. But the goal is to win a competition. You know, and, and we're up against it. There's some wonderful football teams at the moment. And, you know, Penrith is certainly leading the way in regards to pathways, recruitment and um, developing young players into first grade players. They've got great squad depth and uh, play a, a very, very uh, attractive brand of uh, footy. And they're, uh, they're a team to chase at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's... Um... It's a tough, uh, it's it's a tough job that you have, mate. And um, I just uh, just wish you all the best for for the season.